to Tuesday Talks. I'm Kimberly Dudick, the CEO and co-founder of the Public Policy Institute of the Rockies. And I'm here today with my co-founder, Sophie Moon. There's Sophie giving you all a wave. We're hosting these Tuesday Talks to address the Public Policy Institute of the Rockies mission of bringing attention to under-addressed issues in Montana, letting you know some of the people working on them, and also giving you the opportunity to learn how to get involved and ask questions that you want answered. These talks are recorded and attendees can post questions in the chat box or in the Q&A box. We will answer as many of these questions as possible towards the end of our talk today. And so welcome today. I'd like to welcome Martha Stahl. We are thrilled to have her as our guest today. Martha has been the president and CEO of Planned Parenthood of Montana and Planned Parent Advocates of Montana since 2013. She also serves as a Planned Parenthood, uh, uh, excuse me, there's prior to that, she, um, she serves as a Planned Parenthood Advocates of Montana board member. Let me get that straight there. Prior to that, she served for nine years as the Vice President for External Affairs for Planned Parenthood of the North Country, New York, and as a board member of Planned Parent Advocates of New York State. She is a 2020 graduate of Leadership Montana and serves on two local nonprofit boards. Martha, thank you so much for being with us today. We are thrilled to have you here. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Well, thank you again. So let's go ahead and we'll just jump in with these questions. But first, I'll give you just kind of an open one. How have you been doing? Uh, ah, <laughs> um, I think like everybody hanging in there. Um, you know, this, these are interesting times and figuring out how to, you know, juggle all of life and work and social life and kids um, has been super challenging. Um, but I think um, I'm really excited to see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm, I like to say half vaccinated. So in a couple more weeks, I'll be fully vaccinated, which I'm really looking forward to, though it probably won't change much right away, but <laughs> it's very exciting. Well, it's very exciting. So please tell us about the work that you are doing at Planned Parenthood so everyone knows. Sure. So um, at Planned Parenthood of Montana, our mission is to really to provide, promote, and protect sexual and reproductive health care and education for all Montanans. So we think that all people should have barrier-free access to um, cutting-edge sexual and reproductive health care, including birth control. Um, and we're really working for a, Mon for a Montana, excuse me, where everyone is free to express their sexual and gender identities, where birth control is easily accessible and affordable, where medically accurate sex ed is guaranteed, and where folks can have access to stigma-free abortion freely and with protection. So that's really the core of the work that we do. Um, and we do this through what we always call the three-legged stool, which is healthcare, education, and advocacy. So how did you become involved with this work? Yeah, so um, for, for me, like many Planned Parenthood staff in Montana and around the country, it's really deeply personal. Um, and it's sort of a convoluted story, but I always like to share it because I think it just speaks to uh, my own commitment to the work, but it's also not uncommon for folks who work with Planned Parenthood to have these kinds of stories. So I grew up, I was born in 1975, um, and I grew up, my parents were divorced. Um, my mom was like a uh, classic 1970s, 80s feminist mom um, with our bodies ourselves and Ms. Magazine in the house. And my dad actually was a United Church of Christ pastor. Um, and so um, I grew up going to his church and my mom's church, also at UCC church, and really from a very young age, they both instilled in me um, two things, I think. One, our responsibility to care for one another. Um, and second, really the, the my own bodily autonomy, right? Um, so I really thank my mom and my dad for that. Um, and after I graduated from grad school, I was living in Texas and I went to go work for a sexual assault and domestic violence uh, center and started working in nonprofit development. And then I later worked um, in higher education, also in development. And then in 2004, I was actually looking to move to upstate New York. I was living right outside of New York City. And I saw this job for an external affairs person at a teeny tiny Planned Parenthood affiliate. 
Um, it was three counties, or two counties and three health centers, really, really small in a very rural um, place in upstate New York in the Adirondacks. Um, and so I applied for the job and I was hired. I was really, really excited when they hired me because development was not in the job description. And I remember in the interview, I said like, so excited not to do development. I don't think I ever want to do that again, which those words have <laughs> come to haunt me probably for the rest of my career. Um, I was really, really proud to work for the organization. Um, and it really, I think fit with my, um, philosophical thinking and approach in the way I was raised around sexual and reproductive health. But I will say that I definitely said quite a few times in the first couple of years that I worked there that, and I hear this from Planned Parenthood supporters too, that, um, you know, I said, I, I totally support people's right to have an abortion, but I would never have one myself. And then um, I'd been working there for about two years. My daughter was born. Um, and about four months after she was born, I found out I was pregnant again. And um, I remember just knowing so clearly that having a second child right so quickly after my first was not gonna be for me. Um, I wasn't sleeping, I had some postpartum depression. And so I worked actually upstairs in the health center um, in our admin office. So I remember walking downstairs um, making myself an appointment. And I sat down with our counselor, who was a woman named Arlene. And I remember feeling two things, totally deeply convicted that, you know, I was not the time for me to have a second child, though I, you know, was thinking maybe someday I would want one. And also feeling really ashamed and embarrassed um, and really being struck by that, by being someone who worked in this field and how much I didn't know and, um, you know, how it escaped my mind, for example, that I could have taken the morning after pill. And I did this work on a daily basis and feeling that sort of shame and stigma. Um, and then having her hold my hand and say to me, you know, you're not the first person to have gone through this. You're not the first staff person who's gone through this. And you're definitely not the first person I've seen today as a patient who, who is feeling this way. Um, and she really, you know, made sure that I knew that whatever it was that I wanted to do was the right decision because I knew what was best for me. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I ended up ending that pregnancy. And interestingly enough, two years and two months later, I had my son who was delivered by the same doctor who had actually uh, performed my abortion, which I just thought was like kind of a classic, <laughs> classic story about how all of this stuff is connected. So I really think that, that the care that I got that day changed my feeling about Planned Parenthood in a really deep way um, and made it beyond just sort of like a, a intellectual understanding of these issues and made it so deeply personal for me and why I really can't imagine doing other kinds of work. Um, and I've been a patient ever since. So that's the uh, sort of the long story of how I got initially involved and then sort of how it became part of my soul, I would say. Well, thanks for, thank you for sharing your story. I yeah. know it's a deeply personal story. So thank you for sharing that with us. So let's move on to like your work at Planned Parenthood. Tell us about the problems that you all are trying to address there and the programs that you have. Yeah. So I would say um, at the, the, the very core of the issues that we're trying to solve is this, and that is that access to sexual and reproductive health care in Montana, but also across the country, is really, really inequitable. So where people live, like what their zip code is, their race, their gender, their insurance coverage, their income, all of those things really deeply impact whether or not folks can control their own reproduction the extent to which they can do that, um, the access they have to most effective methods for them. Um, and then on top of that barrier, you layer on stigma around not just abortion, but sexual health generally, um, a lack of sex education, again, in Montana and across the country. And we end up with some really, really deep disparities in healthcare. Um, and some of those disparities are you know, directly related to things like sexual and reproductive health, like you know, STI rates, um, uh, uh, unintended pregnancy rates, but also the sexual and reproductive health care is really closely linked to the rest of our health and to the health of our families. So um, 
I think I'll tackle your, your programs question kind of along the three legs of the stool. Um, so our healthcare services are really intended to provide a safe place for folks to get compassionate care. Um, we provide a whole range of services, um, which I'm sure most people know. So from birth control to annual exams, cancer screenings, STI testing and treatment, gender affirming care, abortion, integrated behavioral health. Um, and I will say that I'm, I'm really proud of two programs that we've launched just in the last year in the midst of the pandemic. Um, because I think they, they really get at some of the, the big problem that we're trying to solve. And those two things are telehealth and integrated behavioral health. Um, so I personally have been amazed as our patients have been about how much of the work that we do in our health centers we can actually do over telehealth. Um, I love the fact that folks who live five hours away from a Planned Parenthood health center can actually get care from us without traveling. Um, and um, the integrated behavioral health, I think it was really fortuitous. We started to plan that before the pandemic, um, but it's taken on a new level of importance as we you know, all face this collective loss and grief and anxiety from COVID. And we see that among our, our patients as well. And when our patients come to us for healthcare, really they come to us, you know, obviously as a whole person. Um, and it's been been very hard um, in the past for our clinicians when they have some a patient in front of them that's facing some, you know, emotional issues, difficult things in their lives, depression or anxiety, and to have no place to send them. So launching that has been really, really great for us uh, and for our patients. Um, and then in terms of education, um, we have really changed over the last few years, our approach to sex education. Um, traditionally, and for many years, Planned Parenthood sex ed programs really looked like an educator going into a classroom in a, in a school and providing programming. And um, over the last couple of years, we've really changed that um, to a, a different approach, which is really finding ways to amplify that, that programming. Um, and helping to train the folks who already have the relationships with youth across the state. So that could be teachers, school nurses, tribal health folks, um, training those folks to actually deliver the education themselves. Um, and we're also working on developing a curriculum right now for native and rural youth. Um, and we're working on training educators to deliver content on healthy relationships across the state. Um, I, I think we're seeing, you know, more and more obstacles to providing sex ed, quite frankly. Um, we've seen that in our legislature in this session. Um, but I actually have a lot of hope for thinking about ways in which sex ed can be just sort of integrated into our, our, our youth's lives in lots of different ways. Um, and there's a real appetite for educators to have the information uh, because like it or not, they get asked the questions. And so when they're prepared to answer them, they feel much more confident in that. Of course, then there's the third leg of the stool. Um, and all of that really relies on the advocacy work, right? We need to have access um, to preserve access to health care. We need policy that encourages, not discourages sex education. Um, and re we really work on providing avenues for people to be advocates for that access. Um, because that's what makes the other work possible. Um, and I have a feeling we'll probably talk a little bit more about advocacy in the legislature <laughs> in, a, in a little bit here. So I'll, I'll stop there for now, but I have a feeling that's going to come up. Well, let's let's talk about that elephant in the room. Yeah, yeah. it's a very active legislature when it comes to trying to take away Montanans' rights, including the right to reproductive health care. So um, tell us about the work that you've been doing in the legislature and about really the attacks on reproductive rights that are guaranteed by our Montana constitution. I mean, what have you been doing and where are we at with that? Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for pointing out they're protected by our constitution. <laughs> it's like to start there, like super yeah. important. Uh, and probably the reason why my hair is only half gray, right? Um, that we have such a strong constitution. So well, yeah, this session, I like, wow. And um, first of all, the th first thing I would wanna say is I, you know, I'm happy to talk about Planned Parenthood's work in this, but I think it's really important to recognize that Planned Parenthood is actually part of a much bigger ecosystem of organizations that are working on the same issues. So we have a few 
a, a handful, a pretty big handful of organizations that are dedicated to reproductive rights and sexual and reproductive health care. We work closely with other groups that want to protect access to health care writ large. Um, we're working with in coalition with other folks to protect the rights of LGBTQ um, plus Montanans. Um, and um, we're also really working in service to our patients and in partnership in that ecosystem, but also with individual folks who care about our issues. So we're certainly not alone in this work. Um, and also this session has been absolutely awful for so many people across our state um, for issues related to sexual and reproductive health, but a lot of other issues as well. I just think it's important to recognize that these things are not happening in a vacuum, which I think we all know. So, um, what has happened? What are we looking at? So currently awaiting the governor's signatures are bills that do a whole bunch of things, ban abortion after 20 weeks, interfere with the relationship between the healthcare provider and the patient, put multiple barriers between people seeking um, medication abortion, um, that endanger the safety of patients, uh, that threaten the privacy of patients and of their providers, potentially putting them in harm's way. And that's just three bills, right? <laughs> There's three bills that do all of that. Um, on top of that, you know, we're, we're looking at a personhood amendment, a bill that bans Planned Parenthood from providing sex education, the religious refusal bill, um, you know, I could, I could go on, but there's a lot out there. And I think um, for me going into this session, um, I had a false hope probably, but a real hope um, and a great hope that work was actually gonna get done on the issues that the voters care about and wanna see jobs, economy, access to healthcare. Um, and instead we are just seeing this extremist agenda being fast-tracked um, and it, you know, it's, totally out of step and a line of what we as Montanans were looking for from this legislature, um, which is, I think makes it even harder just knowing that there were, th there were things that we would have liked to see actually happen that are not happening. Um, and instead we're just getting, you know, this barrage of bills that are, that are really awful for, um, for women, for people of color, for, um, trans people, right? It's just, it, it seems like it's never ending. Um, that being said, I will say that watching um, how citizens have engaged and residents of Montana have engaged during this session has really been very affirming. Um, I, I don't think I have ever cried so much listening to hearings and not just because these bills are so awful, but because I'm just totally in awe of the bravery and the power that I have heard in the people offering testimony um, and and the personal stories that people have been telling are just gut-wrenching um, and also speak to the resiliency of, of the people that we're fighting for. Um, so I would just say that, you know, Planned Parenthood really trusts um, the people that we serve and they trust us to fight alongside with them. So, you know, I think we're getting close to the end of session. I guess close is relative, <laughs> um, but we're getting there. Um, and when it's over, we don't stop fighting. Um, we will we we will take this fight to wherever it needs to go next. So we're there in the Capitol now. If some of this stuff goes to the ballot, we will be there. Um, and I think certainly going back to what you said, Kim, I think that the the other next logical step is taking this to the courts, which. Um, we have such a strong protection of the right to privacy in Montana, stronger than, you know, is in our U.S. Constitution. And um, even though in, in all of these bill testimonies, it's been pointed out time and time again, like uh, unconstitutional, unconstitutional, they still move forward. And so um, we'll keep moving forward to, to fight it on that front, too. Well, thank you. Thank you for that and all your work you're doing. Yeah. It's really interesting to find out how much money is being wasted on these unconstitutional bills. Well, I have to say that is that has been part of the conversation, right? Like we know that we'll fight them. Um, and there's a strong appetite to do that. Um, you know, folks in Montana know that that's important. Um, you know, we're all watching the courts across the country to see where this is happening. And 
And so we'll we'll be doing it and the state is gonna have to defend these bills. Um, and it takes a huge amount of time and money. It's just, yeah. And not even thinking about putting things on the ballot, which is also outrageously expensive um, and, and requires even more money. So um, yeah, it, it unfortunately was not an argument that was winning in order to keep the stuff from, you know, being- well, the fight's not over, so right. yeah. All right, so um, what do you want listeners to understand about Planned Parenthood and the work you're doing? Yeah, so I think a couple of things. One of the things that has been really obvious to me, um, I knew it before, but I think, I think um, it's becoming clearer to other folks is just how much Planned Parenthood is part of our public health system. You know, we're not public health in the same way that, you know, the city, county health departments are, um, but we are working to solve public health problems. Um, and um, for many of our patients, we are where they enter the healthcare system. Um, they're not necessarily seeing other providers. Our patients tend to be younger, healthier. Um, and so Planned Parenthood is sort of their point of entry. And so being connected to the rest of the public health system is really, really important. Um, and I think the other thing that's really important for people to know and to think about is how sexual and reproductive health is not, um, it's not just an issue for women. It's not just an issue for LGBTQ folks. Um, and sexual and reproductive health care is not something that should be seen as like a luxury or something that we're lucky to have. It is actually super critical to the health of individuals, but also to the health of our state and the health of our state in more ways than just physical, right? Like our state's economic health, the emotional health and mental health of folks across our state and our physical health, like it's all, it's all connected. Um, and then the other thing um, I would like people to know, and I just have to say it sometimes out loud for myself, which is in spite of what the extremists in the legislature would have us believe there is actually really widespread support for access to this kind of care across of our across our state um and so we're not alone and our patients are not alone um there are you know tens of thousands of folks who are you know actively identified supporters 70,000 of the 70,000 of them who are identified as Planned Parenthood of Montana supporters who are there with them um and um, I think it's also important for folks to recognize that in order to make change, we, we can't be silent. Um, and sometimes, particularly right now, advocating for pro-sexual and reproductive health policy can sort of feel like yelling into the void. <laughs> um, like, is anybody listening? Um, it's not. And the reality is that we have elected champions who totally need to hear thanks. And there are actually quite a few folks um, in our legislature who struggle um, with these votes, right? They understand personally how important access to sexual and reproductive health care is. They, they may not think of themselves as um, supporting access to abortion, but they understand the importance of family planning. Um, or they just, they know a personal story that happened in their life or someone they love's life. Um, and they, and they, they don't, they don't vote um, for these bills because, because they don't support that access, but because there are extremists controlling the agenda. And those are the people we have to talk to. And um, I think having those conversations, whether they're with folks who are elected or our friends and neighbors is really key to this and helping folks understand the stories of who this impacts um, and bolstering those folks so that they can, they can, do what they know is right um, when they're taking these votes. So um, those are the two things really, the critical to the public health system and we gotta keep talking about it, even if it feels in moments like this, like it's totally futile because people are with us and they need the tools to be able to talk about it. So what is your contact information and how can people become involved? Yeah, so um, the there's a couple of ways. I saw that our um, website um, information is in the chat. So I will give my email because I'm always happy to answer emails. Um, so my email is martha.stall at ppmontana.org. Uh, 
And if other if people do want to get involved, they can go to our website and sign up to be on our on our list. Um, and you can also go to PlannedParenthoodAction.org and do the same there. So that way folks can get action alerts about what's happening in the advocacy and political space. Um, but I think there, there are lots of ways for folks to be involved. Um, even though I said earlier that when I first worked for Planned Parenthood, I never wanted to do fundraising again, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about donating <laughs> to Planned Parenthood. But not just Planned Parenthood. I think folks should support Planned Parenthood and they also need to support the independent abortion providers in our state. They need to support family planning providers. They need to support the organizations that advocate for LGBTQ folks, for trans people, for, um, uh, for BIPOC communities, for indigenous communities. All of that stuff is really, really important. Um, and many of those groups also do advocacy. Um, so I think those things are really important. And then volunteering is, is really, is really, really important. Um, I think volunteering, particularly around things like advocacy, has become easier in some ways for a lot of people in this Zoom culture because people can t actually, more people have testified on, on bills uh, and against these bad bills than ever in the past because people can do it from home and it just feels more comfortable. So uh, we really encourage folks to get involved in that way. Well, thank you for all of that. I'm going to turn this over now to Sophie, who is going to ask some questions that people would like the answers to. So go ahead, Sophie. Thanks, Kim. And thanks again, Martha, for joining us today. Yeah. Um, if anyone has any more questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat section or the Q&A, um, and we'll go ahead and get those answered. Um, the first question is really more of like a comment on things, and if you could respond to it, um, that'd be great. So this participant says, um, this might be something that I just keep missing, so I'm sorry if that's what's happening, but I don't hear enough discussion in media or other communications of the actual impact of anti-abortion legislation. Um, they go on to say research shows higher infant mortality, worse health outcomes for women, no statistically significant reduction in abortion rates. Um, I feel like the media allows this assumption to be made that abortion laws do what Republicans claim. I also think plenty of pro-life people would care about the fact that these laws don't work. Do you want to speak to that more? Yeah, I mean, I think that is a, it's a really, really good point. Um, and, you know, I, I think, that, boy, this session has been, I, I feel for the folks in the media trying to cover all of these issues. There is so much to cover. And I think there has been some good coverage about what this, what this, what these bills actually do. But I also think that our, our conversation as a state has not been about that. And I think that's really important for the conversation to be about that because you're absolutely right to, to the commenter who said that these bills actually don't do any of the things that they purport to do. The, the big um, claim on, on, you know, three of the, two of the bills anyway that are, that are headed towards the governor first is that they improve health and safety for patients, um, which they don't. And actually they contain things that or could be actually dangerous to the health of those those patients. And the people who care most about the health and safety of patients are their providers because that is their job. Um, and you know, I think the other thing that we don't talk about is not just with abortion, but family planning, how lack of access to family planning actually does all of the things that the commenter mentioned, right? Like family planning is super important to have healthy women and healthy babies, um, the spacing of pregnancies, um, early interventions when folks are thinking about becoming pregnant, treating STIs, all of that stuff has a huge impact on the outcome of, of later pregnancies. And that's not something that we talk about enough, I don't think. Um, I think what happens is we end up in this, this conversation where one side is talking about the science and what, what the outcomes will actually be, but the other side is talking from a very emotional, ideological place. Um, that being said, I do think um, that has changed a little bit this, this session with some of the testimony because um, we've had opponents coming in on these bills talking from an equally emotionally moving place, which I think has been really, um, as I said, brave and also very powerful. Thanks for elaborating more on that. Um, 
so kind of another question along that same line, and I know that you talked about this before too, um, but you know, you mentioned before that watching powerful testimony was really powerful for you too. Um, I wonder, you know, one of the questions we get a lot is, is it even worth testifying? You know, there's a majority Republican legislature, you know, the governorship is held by a Republican. Is it even worth, you know, reaching out to my legislator? And I wonder if you, not to beat a dead horse here, but if you could speak more to, you know, is it actually valuable for people to make this testimony and engage with their legislators? Yeah, yeah, um, yes, yes, yes. It's so totally valuable. And I think it's valuable in a couple of ways. I think there are certainly folks in our legislature who are not listening, right? Who sit in these commi committee hearings. They already know what it is that they believe um, and they are not gonna listen. Um, but I actually think most of our legislat legislature um, actually is listening. And that's true on both sides of the aisles, right? Like, you know, part of the job is to listen. And I think that there are folks who are listening. Um, I think it's hard because the votes don't always show that. They don't always show the conversations that are happening behind the scenes. Um, but it builds, it builds a groundswell. And it's really helpful for the folks who are champions for this work, who are in our legislature to hear these stories and then to be able to lift them up in the spaces where the voices of the people are not like on the floor right you know through through debate over the bills before they're voted on so many times we hear those stories come back again and again later um and i think it's really important regardless of the outcomes is to is to tell the story right to tell the story about how Montanans feel about these issues, how they impact real people, and all of that testifying on bills is part of, of telling that story. Um, and, and the last thing I'll say is, while, while it's really hard to sit in um, in committees and hear folks say really awful things about Planned Parenthood patients, about women, um, I and, and I know that's true for folks um, coming to this, working on, on work around trans Montanans um, and BIPOC people, um, it's really hard to hear that stuff. Um, and um, when I put on my, um, my political uh, Planned Parenthood Advocates of Montana hat, um, it is, uh, that is the stuff that, that when it comes out of the mouths of legislators really helps down the road when, um, when RC4 is engaged in that political work and is lifting up like, do you know what that person said? And also on the C3 side, holding folks accountable. You know, their responses to, to testimony are really telling. And that's an important part of holding people accountable for what it is that they're doing. Absolutely, I appreciate you talking more about that. Um, another question we have is, are you forecasting any of the issues we're seeing right now in the Montana legislature related to reproductive rights actually making it onto the ballot for the next cycle? Uh, we shall see. I am afraid to even say, <laughs> to be quite frank. Like, um, I hope not. Um, I hope not because, um, as we talked about earlier, working on ballot initiatives is a ton of work, and it's really and it's it's hard work and it's expensive work. Now, I certainly believe that you know when that that work is done and folks go to the go to the the polls and vote and if these end up on the on the ballot, go to these issues, we'll really you know actually hear what Montanans think, and I think some of the extremists will be surprised. Um, but I I think at this point it's there's still some moving parts um, on the the personhood constitutional amendment as well as on the so-called born alive um, ballot initiative bill that at this point um, I wish I knew <laughs> how it was going to end up um, but it, we're still watching and waiting um, to see how it how it turns out. Yeah, I appreciate maybe not wanting to forecast that yet. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, the last question that I have here, and if anyone else has any more questions, go ahead and throw them in now. Um, this participant asks, we have seen a politicization of abortion and a politicization of the COVID-19 vaccines. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any intersections here or lessons that could be learned from either side of that issue? Uh, yeah, I think there, there are some um, intersections. And I actually think, 
well, I don't just think there there has been some um, some direct connection between the two, um, which is not based in fact, right? Um, some some folks will talk about vaccines and and the process of developing vaccines and um, the use of some uh, fetal stem cell lines, right? So. Um, I think there's a very actually overt piece there. Um, but I also think that there has been an interesting intersection of them that we've seen since the beginning of the pandemic of some of the same folks, right? Like I recognize them <laughs> standing in front of who stand in front of Planned Parenthood health centers or testify in in favor of these anti-reproductive health bills or this some of the same folks, not all of the same folks saying like, don't tell me what to do with my body, right? Like, don't tell me to wear a mask. And um, it's it's really, really fascinating how, uh, again, not for all people, but how the the line between what's okay for me versus what's okay for you gets drawn. Um, I also think the other big intersection there is around science, right? Um, we talk a lot, um, Planned Parenthood does in our testimony against these bills about actually the, like the science and the medicine and the evidence. Um, and I think there's there's a lot of echoes there of, of folks who choose to believe science or not to believe science. Um, I'm a, obviously a big proponent of science. I really like science. Um, and so I did, there's a lot of places where those things come together really overtly and in really fascinating ways. Um, I have, I've had the hope that maybe there could be a few people out there that because of this are like, hey, wait a minute, maybe I should think differently about telling people what to do with their bodies, but time will tell on that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for going into that more. Um, I have another question here. Where does Planned Parenthood need volunteers and what kind of work would they do? Yeah, so um, we certainly love and have the biggest need for volunteers um, in our advocacy work, um, as well as on the C4 side doing political work, right? Like we're always constantly, constantly doing things like phone banking and when we're not in COVID, door knocking, canvassing, crowd canvassing, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's a great way to get involved. Um, I know not everybody loves to be on phones. Um, so we always try to make sure we have places for people to plug in, whether that's even like data entry. Um, the other big place we need volunteers is storytellers. So um, it can be really hard to tell stories about our, you know, reproductive health. Um, but some of the, some of those stories um, and and the needed stories aren't always even about abortion. They're just about how people had access to care. Um, so volunteers as storytellers are really important. Um, you know, we also need volunteers in other parts of our organization. We have an all-volunteer board. Um, we engage volunteers in things like fundraising. Um, we have some limited volunteer opportunities around our education programs and our health centers. Um, folks always want to come volunteer in health centers, which is just a little tricky, right, because we're trying to move patients through. And um, But we even have some clinical folks who volunteer for us. So there's lots of different opportunities for folks if they're interested. Awesome. Thank you for speaking more to that. And for anyone who is interested in volunteering, um, we went ahead and posted the links to either um, Planned Parenthood Advocates or um, Planned Parenthood of Montana. So if you want to take action in your community, you should go ahead and click those links and fill out those forms. Um, those are all the questions that the audience has. We really appreciate you being able to answer them all and give us your wisdom on all these different issues. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Kim for the final four questions. Uh, great. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Martha. Before we go into those final four, I have a question of my own, which being a lawyer and having been a legislator, um, I've seen a lot of attacks on the independence of our judiciary this session, mm -hmm. everything from what seems innocuous by dividing our Supreme Court up into different regions so that you wouldn't have one justice um, for the entire state, it would be for different regions as well as uh, making judges and justices declare a political party or allowing the governor to handpick without any sort of real screening people to fill vacancies. Could you just talk about just briefly how that would impact any of those things, reproductive rights. You talked about how we, these laws can be challenged in court. Yeah. What, what long-term could we see if those sorts of changes take place in Montana? 
Yeah, I mean, I think our judiciary, uh, both in the state and then also thinking, we've, we've seen some interesting things happen on the federal level with courts as well. Um, having that independent judiciary is really, really important, right? It's the whole, <laughs> the whole purpose of our checks and balances system. Um, and I, you know, I think if people are concerned about this, I think we should look at to what's happened at the federal level. Um, you know, when we've had uh, nominations to the Supreme Court and conversations about the Supreme Court, you know, even just this past year, there was all this talk about like, oh, the, you know, Biden's trying to pack the court, et cetera, et cetera. But we have seen some pretty intense court packing um, at the federal level during the Trump administration. The number of federal judges who were appointed during during that administration is huge. And those folks are going to be around for a really long time. And so I think, you know, looking beyond the state of Montana to understand what this actually means is, is really important. Um, you know, I, I think that we need to be thinking about the judiciary and also about our own voting rights. Those two things together in conjunction is really, really important. Um, because those are things that really underlie um, our democracy and the way our system works to protect the rights of people. Um, and so I see those, those attacks on the judiciary as being part, part and parcel of the same extreme agenda that seeks to, to take power away from the folks in Montana who have it, deserve it, um, access to not just their health care, but to their right to vote, to um, to an impartial judiciary system that's going to uphold uphold our constitution, right? Yeah. So yeah, I think it's really important and um, not something to be lost in all of this, the importance of that. Right. Well, thank you. Thanks for your thoughts on that. All right, here's our final four questions to let people get to know you a little bit more personally. What's a podcast you're listening to now that you would recommend to others? Okay, I'm going to totally go from like, this has been a very serious conversation. <laughs> Well, are you going to talk about murder? Because that's like our thing. <laughs> I know. You know what? I haven't gotten into the true crime. Um, my, favorite my favorite murder. murder. I have not. I've tried. Okay. Um, okay. So, but my favorite podcast, and um, this was a podcast that was recommended to me many years ago by Kim Abbott. Um, so I have to give Kim credit for it. And that is Pop Culture Happy Hour. So Pop Culture Happy Hour is a short, it's now daily, used to be weekly. It's a podcast with like a rotating cast of NPR arts and culture correspondents and reporters. Um, and so they talk about what's going on in pop culture, like really hard hitting topics. Who is the best Muppet? for example, was a recent, it was a two-parter. <laughs> um, I love that. It's, they're like short enough that I can listen to one while I'm making dinner, or like taking a midday walk. And I'm, and then I like keep my list of like all the things I should be watching, listening to, reading. Yeah. All right. So pop culture happy hour. And that was by uh, it, House Minority Leader Kim Abbott, for those of you who don't know. Mm -hmm. All right. Who's your favorite singer? Uh, okay. This is a super hard question. Um, I really had to think about this a lot. Um, so if I had to choose a lifetime favorite, not my current favorite, because that's rotating, I would have to say, and it's singer slash songwriter, Paul Simon. Um, Art Garfunkel will get some credit in that as well. But like, since I was a kid, I've listened to Simon and Garfunkel, Paul Simon. Like, Sound of violence. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, what is your favorite place to go in Montana? Um, okay, so I live in Billings. Um, so the bear tooths are incredible, they're beautiful. Um, but my favorite place to go is the Priors. Um, nice. I love the Priors. Um, they are, first of all, one of my favorite things about the Priors is that you can go now. Like even like there, the snow melts there so fast. Last year I went camping there in like a week from next this week, you know, two weekends from now. Um, it's always warmer. It's beautiful. It has this totally different desert beauty on the south side. The north side has beautiful trees. It's my go-to place and it's um, easy to get to from Billings. I can be there fast. I can go down for the day and run in, on trails and that kind of thing. So yeah, it's the priors. All right. What's the best advice you were ever given? Okay, so um, I've gotten this question before. Um, years and years and years ago, when I first started supervising folks, I got sent to like one of those really awful management trainings 
where you sit in a room for a day and like eat cold cut sandwiches. Um, but I did get one good thing out of it. And they said that as a supervisor, you should only do the things that you can do. And um, I actually don't think that's always true at work. Um, you know, sometimes like anybody could unclog the toilet, but it's me who should be doing it. Um, but I actually, over the last year, I've come to realize like that that advice, only do the things that only you can do, is how I have to operate as like a working mom. Um, I'm a single mom, a busy professional, because I can pay somebody to mow my yard. Um, I could pay somebody to clean my house, or we could just like not do the dishes, right? <laughs> somebody else could do it, but we don't have to. But there are things that I can only do. Like only I can like snuggle with my son and watch TikTok videos, and only I can take my 15 and a half year old daughter out driving and doing this the entire time. So uh, only do the things that only you can do. That is great advice. All right, well, thank you so much for being with us today and for talking with us. It's been really a pleasure talking with you, Martha. Oh my gosh, it's been fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. For everyone listening today, thank you for listening. We are hosting these talks to provide an opportunity for people to hear about different people and organizations in our state and to learn how they can become involved in shaping your communities. You can reach us at the Public Policy Institute of the Rockies at publicpolicyinstituteofthe-rockies.com, on Facebook at Public Policy Institute of the Rockies, Twitter at Public, excuse me, Twitter at Policy Rockies, Instagram, PPI of the Rockies, and you can email us with any suggestions you have at info at PPIR.org. If you want to listen again to this episode, we are recording these and they're released as a podcast. You can access those from our website or wherever you listen to podcasts. And they're also recorded and played on the Missoula Community Access Television on Tuesday nights and Friday nights. So we have trying to reach as many people as possible. Thank you all for listening. We'll be back again next week with another great episode. So tune in then and let's keep moving Montana forward together. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>